The President of the United States of America takes pleasure in presenting the Navy Cross to Hospitalman Apprentice Louis E. Fonseca, United States Navy, for extraordinary hero heroism in action against the enemy while serving as Corpsman Amphibious Assault Vehicle Platoon, Company C, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, Regimental Combat Team 2, Task Force Tarawa, 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom on 23 March 2003. During Company C's assault and seizure of the Saddam Canal Bridge, an amphibious assault vehicle was struck by a rocket-propelled grenade, inflicting five casualties. Without concern for his own safety, hospitalman apprentice Fonseca braved small arms, machine gun, and intense rocket-propelled grenade fire to evacuate the wounded Marines from the burning amphibious assault vehicle and tend to their wounds. He established a casualty collection point inside the unit's medical evacuation of Febby's assault vehicle, calmly and methodically stabilizing two casualties with lower limb amputations by applying tourniquets and administering morphine. He continued to treat and care for the wounded awaiting evacuation until his vehicle was rendered immobile by enemy direct and indirect fire. Under a wall of enemy machine gun fire, he directed the movement of four casualties from the damaged vehicle by organizing litter teams from available Marines. He personally carried one critically wounded Marine over open ground to another vehicle. Following a deadly artillery barrage, hospital, hospitalman apprentice Fonseca again exposed himself to enemy fire to treat Marines wounded along the perimeter. Returning to the casualty evacuation amphibious assault vehicle, he accompanied his casualties south through the city to a battalion aid station. After briefing medical personnel on the status of his patients, hospitalman Apprentice Fonseca returned north through the city to Company C's lines and to his fellow Marines that had been wounded in his absence. His timely and effective care undoubtedly saved the lives of numerous casualties. Hospitalman Apprentice Fonseca's actions reflected credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the Marine Corps and the United States Naval Service. How long have you been in the Navy? Oh, me a blow life. I'm Jamie Britt. And I'm Heath Britt. And together we are E14. We have 40 years of naval service. And each week we discuss a potpourri of topics, which we like to call smoke pit topics. These are real world topics that concern us, our marriage, and our Navy with a sailor twist. So join us each week as we dive into the deep end. Booyah! Hey everyone, welcome back to E14 Podcast. I'm Jamie Britt. And I'm Heath Britt. And together we're E14. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of our own and not the United States Navy or the United States Marines or our respective commands. So you can take it or leave it. Well, you want to introduce our guests? I I'm mean, up. after this introduction, I'm sure they already are like chomping at the bit. To yeah, you. we have, the, <laughs> we have the pleasure. We definitely have the pleasure of having retired hospital corpsman are also known as Devil Corman, Devil Doc. Devil or, Doc, yeah. I like to say Devil Doc. Squid. Yeah, me too. <laughs> we have Louis Fonseca. Louis, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. E14, thank you guys so much for having me and reaching out um, to share my story, um, my career, my 22-year my career, and uh, what my passion is now after we finally hang up that hat, you know, for mm. good and, and what's next uh, after Navy life. So thank you so much to both of y'all for having me on. Yeah, thank you for coming Our on. absolute pleasure, man. So you retired, what, last, last year? Correct. Uh, June 30th of 2021 was my official date. I started terminal and uh, my wife and I actually had a dual retirement ceremony on March. Oh, cool. Oh, I'm sorry, on May 14th, 2021. So I was just... 12 days shy of 22 years. And that's only because, you know, the Navy makes you retire on the last day of the month. And right. they wouldn't approve me to go to the end of July. So, but so I say 22 years, but really 21 years, 11 months and 
however many days. That's so. close enough. That's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> right. close For enough. all the listeners out there that can't see us, if you're not on YouTube watching us, um, you have the most amazing beard for one year of <laughs> oh, growing thank you, it thank out. You. Yeah. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. And you pull it off well. Better yeah. than I did. That's thank why you, I just trim mine up. I look, like an, I look like a child molester with yeah. my shit on. So. Did you grow that right after retirement? Like, boom. Beard oh, yeah. Time. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> I, and, and I don't say I hate to say this, um, but my junior sailors that were at my command, you know, the last three months, uh, I mean, hair regulation was, no, it's a one inch taper. I don't get high in tights anymore. You know, yeah, the- yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Towards the end. Because yeah. when we call you the devil squid or the devil doc, that means you were with the Marine Corps. Yeah, Green Corps. Correct. Side. Yeah. Green, yeah. Green Corpsman. So you were with the Marines and their standards aren't quite the Navy standards. Correct. <laughs> and, and, and as a Navy Corpsman, we really do have the the privilege and I consider it a true privilege uh, to request to go what we call Marine regulations. And that's where we're authorized to wear the Marine Corps brown shirt, you know, and the green pants and the green jacket, but you have to meet their weight standards, their hair and grooming standards. And so I did do that my first tour with my Marines, just so I can be really a part of my Marines. Um, Let's go but back you can and kind of for the listeners, let's t- yeah. let's go back and tell them, OK, so the Navy Corpsman, you have two sides. We call it blue side, green side. Right. Mm-hmm. So as you join, you you do you choose to go with the Marines or do you just get lucky and get picked to go green side? Yes. And yes. So when I went to hospital Corpsman A school, so um, for y'all that aren't too aware of Navy terminology either. Uh, A school is our MOS school, military occupational school. In, in the Navy, we call it NEC, Navy Enlisted Classification. So when you first go to your A school and you're getting ready to graduate, they give you a dream sheet. And on that dream sheet, you get to pick the three jobs. You, if the Navy would allow you to, where do you want to go? You know, some people pick overseas. You have some sailors that want to go right back home, Right. Um, you have some sailors that want to go with the Marines or with SEAL team units or whatever. On my sheet, I just put F M F. And so my instructors knew like, all I wanted to do was go with the green side. Didn't matter which coast where just stick me with the Marines. And so that's how I first started my career with the Marines. I kind of always knew that's what I wanted to do. Be green side. Um, but then when 10 years after being in the Navy, when a command master chief finds out that you're getting ready to go back out to sea and he asks you, hey, what's next in your Navy career? And you're like, I'm going to go be with the Marines again. He's like, oh, Fonseca, you've been there, done that, have the deployments, have the awards. Why don't you come follow me to this Navy ship, the USS Bataan? And I tell a lot of sailors that that tour right there really gave me such an appreciation for being not just a Navy hospital corpsman, but also a U.S. Navy sailor, you know, yeah. to actually finally serve into the branch of service that I went to boot camp for and see what our fellow brothers and sisters do to keep us fed on the ship, keep us clothed on the ship, but most importantly, keep that ship pushing forward regardless mm-hmm. of what's going on around us. So, so that's unique because you got to serve on both sides. And I know mm-hmm. you, like you mentioned earlier, you had the, the privilege to wear the Marines uniform, but y'all don't um, when you go green side, you don't just automatically get to where look like the Marines. You have to like, like you said, you have to pass their standards, their PRT. Correct. Yeah, you don't. You, I mean, you got to look the part to wear the Marine uniform. They're not gonna let our our chubby <laughs> sailor. <The> chubby guys. <laughs> chubby yeah, guy. yeah, it, one hundred percent right because their body fat st- standards are less than yeah. ours. They have a three mile run. We have a, we have a mile and a half run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, yeah, you'll um, um, you'll have, you know, those guys that wish to do it, but just aren't physically meeting the standard that the Marine Corps has. Um, later on in my career, when I went back to the Marines as a senior second class um, and then I became an HM1, uh, at that tour, I decided to, to stay in, in Navy regulations, not because I was I was doing marathons and triathlons at the time. So in shape, I was in shape. But um, by that time in my career, as much as I love my Marines and I love serving with the Marine Corps and a lot of my brothers and sisters are Marines, um, like I said, that Navy ship instilled that Navy pride back in me. And and I I was proud to wear my dress uniform, my Navy dress uniform around my Marines. 
you know, I was, you know, uh, I, I have a big squid tattooed on my leg because after that ship tour is like, yeah, I'm a squid and I'm proud yeah. of being a squid, you know? Um, so yeah. That's cool. That's I, awesome. I agree. I'm, I'm down with you, man, because that, that Navy sea life, it does two things. It, it increases your Navy pride. Definitely. But when you go to shore duty or something, you forget how hard it was on that ship. Mm -hmm. You work your ass off on those ships for sure. Yes. It is, it is a challenge to, to get up, especially in the rates where you're seeing, and you're in a, on a baton, you had a pretty decent sized medical department. So you were seeing Correct. a lot of people and you had Marines on board at times being a amphib. So Correct. you were still, you still had that Marine side. Mm -hmm. And then, but you had the, you were actually working for the Navy on, yes. on the ship. So it's a little different. Yeah. You know, I just had, um, I was the moto speaker for the graduating, uh, field medical training battalion class here West in Camp Pendleton. They just graduated on Wednesday and I was their motivational speaker. And, and that's one thing I spoke about was what gives you the appreciation is when you get on a ship and then you're a medical, right? You're the medical personnel. So you're bitching and complaining about how many patients we have. Oh my gosh, you know, it's getting warm in here, but we forget that, you know, fight uh, five decks above us. The Airedales are launching, you know, aircraft in 120 degree weather yeah. on a yeah. black, on a black non-skid, right? And then you have your, your engineers working in the main spaces, working in 140 degree temperature where they can only work for 10 minutes out of the day and then go sit in a box to cool down yeah. for so many minutes before they can go back out there and work again. Yeah. You know, you you see your, your, your CSs busting out chow at three in the morning to start getting the whole crew fed by five. And they're up till 22, 2300 that night, you know, getting everything ready the next day. And so I tell my corpsman, like, you want to, you want to feel special and, and, and have an appreciation for who we are in the Navy, go to a, to a Navy ship and you'll find out how easy we have it, how luxurious we have it and how for granted we can easily take that. Wow. Getting yeah, chills. Fun. Cause yeah, you're, to right. you're totally right. And not a lot of people see the big picture like mm. that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I I want to point out, you know, Heath read your, your Navy cross. You were at E2 at the time. Yeah. Correct. Oh, shit. So this was this like the very first thing that pretty much you did or the first deployment first. Uh, well, I mean, first thing in the, yeah. In, in the, the Navy, military. right. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> So my, my mathematicians out there probably already did the math where he served 22 years, retired last year. That means he came in in 1999. Mm -hmm. But wait, Iraq didn't happen until 2003. How come he's only an E2 in four years? Well, um, I retired with red stripes for a reason. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't have the easiest first three years of my Navy career. I, I was going to be that guy that was just going to get out. Um, and if I was going to get out honorably, it'd be out of sheer luck. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, you know, the twin towers happened. Um, I had been selected. I was a, a frock to HM three on a Friday, Saturday, went out to celebrate with my friends by Monday. Uh, my battalion colonel said, give me your crow back. And here's your two French fries, right? Because as a frocking in the Navy, you're not paid. So you're right. reducing pay grade. So, um, you reduce got, not just we, one, you reduce down to down two, two times. Yeah. Right. So, um, got busted or, or reduced down to the rank of E2, um, got put on 60 days restriction. I'd already made trouble within the, the, the battalion, just not enough to really get NJP would at that time. And I'd, I'd also been the first corpsman and, you know, the battalion colonel will tell you one thing, what true history is, I don't know. But suppose I was like the first corpsman in like 20 years to ever get a DUI in that battalion. So he was going to make an example. I'd already pissed him off several times before. Um, so I got put on 60 days restriction. And I always tell junior sailors, my 60 days restriction went from 60 days to eight months restriction because I got uh, busted in November, November 22nd of 2002 when I got my DUI. Um, got put on restriction for 60 days. On December 28th, the battalion got the phone call to um, start recalling everyone off a of leave. 
we just got the word that we're going to be uh, getting on board the ships on January 7th to embark and head over to Kuwait to stage. So on January 7th, I was on day 53, 54 of my restriction. I was like six days away, but yeah. now I'm going on a ship to leave my family. And, and, and it was hard because I share this with junior sailors. I was already married. I already had kids. Mm -hmm. But guess where I spent Thanksgiving? In the barracks. Yeah. Guess who brought me Thanksgiving dinner with my family? My that at that time, my wife, right? Luckily, during restriction, I, I never got in any more trouble. So the battalion colonel let a few of us off on Christmas Eve to spend the night Christmas Eve, Christmas Day with our family. And then on the 26th, we had a report right back uh, for um, for restriction at 06 in the morning. Um, so at least I got Christmas off with the family. So, yeah, it, New Year's, it, it was spent in the barracks room um, on restriction. And I always like to share that story with people because... I think some sailors that are married think like, oh, they're not going to put me on restrictions in the barracks room. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. they will. That's bullshit. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> they will. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so you're in, you're on restriction, and and then you have to go get on the ships to go fight this war, and you're still on restriction, and they're still like, all right, just stay here. Is that how that happens? Yeah, because on the Marine Corps side of the house, um, when you get put on restriction and you are a married member you are uh, made to pack everything on that gear issue list, right? Your uniforms, mm -hmm. your SIF gear, anything, and you have to bring it to you in the barracks. And the only thing you can have is, um, I think Marine Corps policies, two civilian clothes with like belt loops and a button shirt, you know, if you have to travel. So, um, so yeah, so I already had everything in my barracks room. All my equipment was there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really it wasn't no. Hey, we're recalling everyone off the off of leave. So all of my restriction guys go home for the next five days and spend time with your family. No, it was very much. We're taking you with us. Too. Yeah, yeah. And it's very much <laughs> you were the you were the dumbass. You're you're uh -huh. the ones that got put on restriction. You know, I was just the one that had to execute that order. But you're the the idiot that got in trouble. So right. don't you know? And that yeah. was I think that's one thing that a lot of senior leadership. And even junior sailors um, came to, I, I would, I guess would say admire about me was, you know, my alcoholism throughout my Navy career could have always boohoo my PTSD, my nine deployments, my shitted leadership, you know, all of that had a small hand in it. But at the end of the day, the responsibility always lied on me. It was always mm -hmm. my decision whether I was going to start drinking that day or not. You know, it wasn't the Navy's decision. It wasn't the Navy's decision to get me drunk, you know, one day and then put me in my car and tell me to go try to drive home. You know, all that was my decision. And I have to own up to it. I have to take responsibility for it because if I push it off on someone else, then I'll never properly heal. You right. Know? No. Yeah. I like and that. Th this was, you said in 2002, right? So in just three short years, you were, you were almost an E4, which is for Corman's that's, that's pretty good. Right. Right. And then you get reversed back. You uh, break some break some barriers or some goals or what do you, what do you call it limits <laughs> by being the first corpsman to get a DUI in twenty years. Mm -hmm. And then you're on the ship. You're headed to war, and you break barriers again, but this time on the positive side. So before we get into that, yeah, what what was your attitude when you first left to to deploy? Was your attitude like FTN and and I mean, you had been pretty pissed off and, and down on yourself a little bit. Um, how do I put this? I never will paint my parents in a bad light. Right. My parents just knew how to parent for mm -hmm. their time frame by how they were taught how to parent by their parents. Got it. Yeah. So I, um, I didn't grow up with a lot of great self-esteem that I was going to grow up to be, you know, someone special, someone great. Um, you know, I always felt like I, I, I would never be enough. Uh, my dad was a 22 army guy. Um, you know, even, even the few times that I felt proud on bringing my report car home, I was a D a D honor roll student my whole career. Yeah. Um, but like, when I really started trying in high school and I brought like all A's 
and B's and just one C. I remember clear as day. And, and me and my psych docs have spoken about it, where my low self-esteem comes from and the, the negative talk comes from and why sometimes I don't want to set high standards for myself because I just remember clearly showing them that report card. The first report card I think I was ever proud of. And my dad just looking at it and just kind of throwing it down. He goes, you see what I still see? A failure. That C. You're still failing. Oh, wow. You know, to, you know, from then it was like, why even try? Why even try? Right. You know? right. um, and so I just got in that mentality. But there was, you know, I had two really great instructors, Senior Chief Winch Diller and H1 John Moores, who H1 Moores retired as a Master Chief Moores, I believe last year as well, or the year before. And they instilled in us the pride and the legacy of the hospital core. And it was something about that and just walking down the hallways and reading those 22 Medal of Honor citations over and over again. And then learning a lot about their stories, how they, a lot of them came from not the best homes either. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them are homeless, you know. Um, and just thinking, man, if, if, if I ever get put in that situation, all I care about is that I have the skill sets to treat my Marines. So a, a funny thing that was said a long time ago in that first battalion would always be like, Doc Fonseca is a great corpsman, but he's a shitty sailor. Mm. So if you need to go to the field, if you need to go to war, take him. If you need to go out and celebrate, don't invite that guy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and it was also part of the culture, you know, Hispanic family. I mean, if you want to call it stereotypical, I will, you know, we drank because it was a good day. We drink because it was a bad day. We drink is because the day ended in the letter Y, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it wasn't like, oh, just one beer, too. Like, I remember seeing all my aunts and uncles. It's once you start drinking in the morning, it's all day long until you're passed out drunk somewhere. Right. So I just always associated that's just how I was supposed to behave. I joined the Navy drink to the foams in our fighting song the drunken right. tatted up sailor i thought i was doing everything right <laughs> <laughs> carrying all the tradition <laughs> right 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 so yeah so um so yeah so i was an e4 and then got busted two ranks so when the citation when people read like oh an ha and he, he was just an e2 when it happened I stopped to learn to correct people that don't catch it because usually they're telling a young HR or HA that might feel like they don't have the skill sets to do something. Yeah. Because as soon as I go, oh, no, no, no. But you got to remember, I was actually an HM3 that got busted. Then it's going to make that junior sailor like, oh, we'll see. Even though he's an HA, he actually made it all the way up to that rank before he got busted. So I always just leave it at that. I was like, yeah, I was an HA and. And that means that you have the same skill set I had during that time, if not more, because Navy medicine, combat medicine has just evolved so much yeah. more. Right. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So. so on that day, right. Uh, on March 23rd, 2003, you were HA, formerly a HM3. You had a little mm -hmm. time in, but still four years. Right. Still, you still were a junior sailor, no matter what pay grade you are after yeah. four years. First, first deployment, never had right. seen any casualty besides a heat casualty on a hike, you know, but wow. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So when the shit hit the fan, lack of better terms, dude, what was going through your head as such a young dude? Cause you, what you were, you joined when you were eight, were you 22 years old? Right. Man, you're a kid. I mean, you're still a kid. Yeah. You haven't lived hard yet. You haven't besides going to mass, you haven't screwed hard yet. You are still a yeah. kid. What right. went through your head? Um, that brotherhood, truly 100% honestly, I had trained with those men. And at that time, it was an all-male unit. Second tracks was all-male unit. I believe last year, they got their first female in the in the AAV units. Um, but I had trained with those brothers for so many years. And, and I think because I grew up with such a negative thought process about myself that when your gunny pulls you to the side, when you're, you know, your lieutenant and then your sergeants, right, pull you to the side like, hey, doc, you're our guy. You need to be here for the other 40 of, of us. While we're pew-pewing and we're going down, 
can we trust you? Yes, yes. And I was very confident in my skill set. I really was. But you form this brotherhood out of training. And then mm. as the closer you get into the reality that we're going to step forward and some of us might not come back home, then you start forming, I wouldn't necessarily say your cliques, but, you know, your Christian Marines and sailors will get together and start doing their Christian prayers and all that. Your Muslims, your, you know, your religion, you know, because we're about to go and they're trying to make peace with whatever might happen tomorrow. Right. right? right. At that time, I considered myself agnostic, but I had a really good friend of mine, um, Corporal Chanawangsi Kamafun, who we call Chuck. And uh, he passed away on March 23rd, who was a Buddhist. And I just talked to him about it. And I remember one of the things that um, I'd asked him, I said, you know what, in your face as a uh, faith as a Buddhist, how do you feel going, you know, into this next firefight or not the next firefight, but into this next mission? And uh, I remember him telling me something, you know, as a Buddhist, I know that this is just a vessel for my energy. And the only thing I can do is use this energy for the good of my brothers out here today. And if that means I don't come home, it means I don't come home, but I'll be reincarnated. He was a very devout Buddhist into my next life. And you, and he goes, Luis, you have to be at peace with what that is, whether it's lights out, you don't ever remember anything, or there is something more beautiful, magical on the, on the other side. So on that day, on March 23rd, um, when the call came out that we had, been ambushed that we ran into an ambush and vehicles were getting hit and gunny came over the phone call and told me hey doc it's time for you to get to work i attested to two things the first and foremost is if you've never been inside of an aav or know what an aav is it's basically a tank that floats in the water so think of it as getting a coca-cola can and the only top that's available is where you pop the top and then you put that coca-cola can in the water mm -hmm. anything inside that can can't see out mm -hmm. So maybe the magnitude and the severity of what was going on around me, not knowing it, right, the naiveness of it, because I'm buttoned down in this vehicle, allowed me to kind of just jump out and get to work. Um, I would like to think more, if not than anything, it was just the fact that I knew, and I've been quoted saying this in, in books before, um, and, 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 and I truly believe this, that the job of a Navy hospital corpsman is to go to hell and back for his Marines. And the part of the quote that I was quoted on was, and if you're more afraid of dying than failing at taking care of your Marines under fire, then you're in the wrong business, yeah. you know? And, and, wow. and I knew, I knew my brothers needed me as cliche as it sounds. Um, I knew I was not going to come home that day. And so in my mindset, the only thing I felt my Marines expected out of me was just to perform my duties until that happened. Wow. And so that, that was my goal. Just keep performing my duties until the, the time came where it stopped, whether, you know, someone threw up the white flag or I got mortally wounded. It didn't matter to me. Um, they were my brothers and, and, and I was going to be there for them, just like they're there for me right now, covering my six. So, you know, Luis, we've, we've uh, heard this a lot from those that are going into combat situations where there's live fire and all of this stuff that um they actually make peace with dying um, yeah. before they because you have to separate it right you have to you have to do it otherwise like you said um if you're more afraid of dying then you're not going to be able to do it so did you see a lot of the guys as well like start to make peace with okay if I die, I die, but I'm going to go in there and I'm going to do my job. Oh, a hundred percent. And and I think that's what's the beautiful thing about the Navy Marine Corps team. And, and, and I can't speak on the army or air force or the space force or coast guard. I've never served with them. I never served alongside them. I don't know their culture. My dad was an army, a 22 year army vet, but like I said, him and I didn't have the best relationship. So it's not like I really gave, two craps about his career to be honest with you um but i think the making at peace you have to right and however you do it for me it was just at that time i considered myself very agnostic like i felt mm -hmm. there was one creator 
just not necessarily God in in the essence of what a Christian God or Judaism God might think. Um, so my coming to peace with death was, and I share this with junior personnel too. I tell them, hey, I'm gonna give you a big secret. If no one's told you this, I'll be the one to tell you this. And I'm sorry you have to hear it this way. But let me tell you what, you're all going to die. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's a guarantee, right? Yeah. None of and us get out of here alive. <laughs> none of us, right? None of us. And um, so just knowing that simple fact and and because I had such a low negative self-esteem about myself, I figured if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it the best I can until I die. And then I survived that one. So then I went on another tour. And then people were like, Fonseca, you're crazy. Like when fire goes off around us, you're standing up looking around instead of taking cover. <laughs> well, what a lot of people, what a lot of people don't realize, and I share this now, it's like, man, that's a brave, you know, you know, nuts made of steel type of dude. No, I just been suicidal for so many years and was too scared to pull the trigger myself that. And I felt like such a horrible person, especially after the Navy Cross was awarded to me. I was like, no, I don't deserve that. I'm, you know, I've been told I'm a piece of shit. I'll never amount to anything. I'm worthless. And I was told also this by my battalion sergeant major, you know, um, and then they put this award on me and, and uh, you know, so it didn't sit right. So all the numerous times I went out there, I share this a lot now was I felt like I was trying to make up for what I felt that award deserved. You know what mm. I mean? Um, so all those crazy things, oh my gosh, standing up in the middle of firefights and be like, they're over there. Come on, why are you being scared? You know? And they're like, oh my <laughs> gosh, Doc's leading a charge. It was really for me, like, if I die on the battlefield, I die a warrior. Because mm -hmm. if I go home, I'm just going to die a drunk or by suicide. So oh it's kind of like yeah. almost that um, suicide by cop you know, yeah, Dana, yeah. it's kind of like that, you know, right. suicide yeah. by war, because right. it's more honorable to die out there than to be sitting in a dark room, drunk again, you know, with my gun in hand, contemplating, all right, is today going to be the day that I pull the trigger or not, you know? Yeah. Wow. Well, I, want to for touch, sharing that. I want to touch on a couple of things that you did, did yeah. uh, while you were got this award. I just want to re reiterate under, this is all under gunfire, mind you, uh, to our audience. So he was he was throwing down tourniquets, administering morphine. You actually helped a guy, uh, a casualty. You actually walked with him to the evacuation or whatever under gunfire. And then you went to a, a battalion aid station, briefed whoever of the uh, – briefed him of the status of the casualties. Then you went back. Mm -hmm. So you, you, got, you got the business. Did you right. think? Then you went back for more. Correct. So, yeah, you, you I mean, no matter how you look at it, you're a badass. And <laughs> no matter what it, that no matter what it, what it, whether you had a death wish or, or not, you saved lives that day and you continue you. to in other, in other uh, deployments you did. So uh, I appreciate your humility, but at the end of the day, you're still a hero. No matter. Thank you. What uh, extreme circumstances cause average people to go to do extreme measures? I mean, whatever it is, you were a subpar sailor prior to that. Badass yeah. doc, subpar sailor, turned freaking hero <laughs> over one instance, and you continue that through the rest of your career. Yeah. Uh, so I commend you, brother. I commend thank you, you. Thank you so much. So let's. Uh, you talked about like in 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 other deployments later deployments, you would, you would go Clint Eastwood, Billy Badass, because it was easier to die to, and you're to die a warrior than to die at home with a gun in your hand, a bottle of liquor in the other hand. Correct. So did that PTSD affect you for, I mean, what, what kind of shit did you go through after, after that March 23rd, 2003 deployment? Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, PTSD, I, I really don't think I started suffering too much from my PTSD until 2005. And the reason being is because I came back from Iraq in June of 03. And then 
October, November of 03, I was back in Afghanistan, operating in the mountains of Afghanistan until June of, of uh, 04. Came home from that six months later, I was back in Iraq operating in uh, January of, of 05. And so, you know, did six, seven month tour there, came home. So you're, now you're talking about three back-to-back -back combat deployments. I had seen, you know, combat in each three tours, pew pews, you know, bad guys over there, us over here, dock this, we need you here, we need you there, Marines down. Um, so unfortunately, I'd seen a lot of it, but I don't think I'd ever really had the time to process it. And then lo and behold, I get transferred to a shore command. Oh, the Navy cross down, huh? Yeah, the Navy cross gets bestowed upon you. I'm at a shore command. Um, you're in HM3 walking around a Marine Corps base. So you see the stairs, you see the whispers, and and um, or you hear the whispers and and uh, I would never, ever, ever downplay harassment women have gone through. But if there's any small little touch of what I can say, I know what that feels like. Yeah, like, yeah, it sucks when you walk into a room and, you know, people are looking at your chest and then whispering, right? You know, yeah, yeah. and like I said, I would never compare that to sexual harassment or, or harassment of women. Um, but I can understand just a little bit if that makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. And, you know, so then that's, you know, when you're home and everything's slowed down and there's no more deployments coming up and now I'm working at a hospital, which is something I never want to do. I always wanted to stay greenside, kick down doors, you know, um, that's when it, when you have the time to stop and stop, start really processing those emotions. That's when, for me, it just started to eat me up, to eat me up. When, um, when that term hero kept getting thrown out there so many times, you know, and, and, and I appreciate the title, but when you don't feel that way, mm -hmm. when you always see the C on that report card, right? That yeah. C to me was, the 18 brothers I lost that day that I couldn't save, right? But then you give me an award and, and say, I did such a great job and you're a hero and the nation owes you this and that. And all I think like, but I failed. And they're like, no, you didn't. You saved a lot. No, no, I failed. I have 18 brothers that we couldn't bring home. I failed, you know? So it, it ate me up and that's where it really started to, you know, and, and yes, Master Chiefs and my commanding officers, anytime I got a speaking request, hey, HM3 Fonseca, hey, HM2 Fonseca, you don't need to take it. You don't need to go speak to anyone. But in my mind, I wanted to make the Navy a career. There was a time in my Navy career that you could not tell me I wasn't going to be the next Force Master Chief or Mech Pond. So what idiot would I be when View Med calls me and says, hey, Hospital Court birthday, we want you to come be our guest speaker, HM2. It's, you know, I'm not going to be an idiot and say, oh, no, Force Master Chiefs, I'm just not comfortable. Um, find someone else, you know, like, right. No, you, 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 you get you do what you get taught. You bury those feelings down. You put on a fake smile. I'll be there in front of all these admirals and master chiefs and generals and sergeant majors and do it with a smile on my face. I won't drink in front of them. That way they didn't see how much I was really drinking. But then. Who was with me at the hotel room after the party was there? You mm -hmm. know, good old Jose Cuervo or, or Jack Daniels, right? Or my beers. And, and yeah, so it, um, my PTSD really started about 2005 when oh. I finally got a, a moment to just take a breath and start really processing everything I'd gone through back to back deployments and, and the loss of lives and all that. So, so I can see it, man. When you, when you uh, thought about those 18 men that, that that perished that day mm -hmm. you think about your dad saying yeah you got to see but that's still a failure correct so you didn't save all of them right right she right. probably humanly impossible but and, in your mind and that's a crazy thing right it, and it took me years to really grasp this and i've read the reports over and over and over again 
And I still said, no, there might have been something, might have been something. And it was finally my gunnery sergeant had already retired at that time. And, and uh, my buddy, Matthew Beavers, uh, that, that basically put it out there like, we could have had 200 Fonsecas running around that battlefield. But when a 500 pound bomb drops on top of a vehicle, even the, we could have had 100 Fonsecas and the best surgical trauma team standing by, like, you can't pick this up and say, oh, I think that might be a vein for an arm. So we'll put that in there and sew it back together, right? We can't put right. humans back together that way. No. Mm -hmm. But my mental health, my PTSD, my traumas, that's what all it focuses on. Like, well, I don't know because I didn't even try. I didn't even make an attempt to run into over there, even though I knew that vehicle was a click away, you know, and, you know, these almost impossible human feats is what ate me up for so long because like you attested to, right? He, I always put back to, nope, but you still failed. You, you, you didn't save them all. You still failed. So it didn't matter if you got one of the highest awards a, a military, a naval person can get. It don't matter. You still failed, right? In your yeah, mind. Uh, in my mind. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Right. So what, well, how bad did it get, brother? I mean, how bad did the, did the demons persist? Um, they um, persist every day. Every day is, uh, um, every day me and my demons sit down and have a nice cup of coffee and we have a little talk and, I, right now, I let them know that um, they won battles for a long time, but I'm winning the war. I got my my team um, to help me out. The worst it got, um, I mean, can you pick a worst? Coming into work drunk, practicing yeah. medicine drunk, um, driving while I was drunk, you know. Um, I am just so very, very fortunate that when I had my DUI as an HM1 2013 and I wrapped my Cadillac around a telephone pole, as ironic as that, as crazy as that is, the irony in that is, if I wouldn't have wrapped my car around a telephone pole, right behind that telephone pole. Have you guys ever been stationed in the Groton, Connecticut area? No. no, uh, I've never been no. There. Um, so Groton, Connecticut area is very mountainous, a lot of windy roads. So you have sheer boulders on each side. Um, that telephone pole stopped me from doing a head-on collision with a boulder about the size of, of, a, of my house. Oh, wow. Um, I went back to the scene after I, after everything was said and done with and and uh, so that was definitely one of my lowest points. My dad also, I got put on administrative separation because of it. And my dad mm -hmm. had died on, on March 14th uh, from a heart attack. And on the 14th, 15th, and on March 17th, I was actually scheduled for an administrative separation board. And the lawyer called me up and goes, hey, Fonseca, I know your dad just died and you're down in North Carolina. He goes, what do you want to do, man? He goes, I'll give you about six hours, but then I need a phone call back. He goes, we can postpone this and it's going to drag out longer. I can just tell the Navy that you're ready to go home and, we, and you'll be administratively separated under honorable conditions. He goes, or you come back up here and fight. And uh, I said, I, I don't know, sir. Right now I'm just dealing with the death of my, my dad and um my dad and I had reconciled about eight months before he passed away. Cause eight months before that's when I got in my DUI wrapped my, mm. my car. My dad was an alcoholic as well for many years throughout his whole army career. Then was sober for the last 14 years before he died. And um, so we reconciled and, and we're talking a lot. And, and um, he was still in the hospital when we we're talking about this. Cause he had his heart attack on a Wednesday and they died on a Friday and after he passed away, I remember Friday night, um, just thinking, I right, am I going to drive back up there to Groton or am I just going to call it quits? And I just remember one thing my dad told me when I first joined the Navy, he goes, okay, you're in it now. Now just try to do your best. And um, 
So I, I took that challenge and I went up and fought for my career. And, and after that, for me, my best was being an advocate about mental health, um, showing junior sailors that those leaders that tell you, you know, oh, yes, we're going to give you mental health. But then when you walk out of their office, they're talking shit about you and they forget mm-hmm. that that shit rolls out of that office. You know, um, I decided I wasn't going to be that type of leader. I was going to be a genuine one for them. Um, and everything was going really well. I had relapsed, though, at that time back into drinking. I had about a, a year of being sober. Um, when one of my senior chiefs, he was the senior enlisted leader at the time for uh, the schoolhouse on sub school base, we had a, uh, an annual picnic and I'd been sober at that time about eight months. And, um, and he just looked at me, had a beer in his hand. He goes, Hey, have you ever had one of this? I said, no, never have. Uh, said, I did drink IPAs when I was still drinking. He goes, oh, Luis, but you're not a real alcoholic. A real alcoholic wouldn't have made it this far. Here, have a little sip. So two months later, I'm standing in front of him and the CO again, explaining why I'm drunk. And in the in the Chiefs DRB board, I said, you know, it's funny because I'm standing here two years, two months later after you handed me the first first beer after being sober for eight months. And I told him, yeah. I said, so what are we going to tell the CO? You know, obviously they, everyone jumped on my ass. You know, I'm a right, HM1. Right. I'm in front of the Chiefs mess the yeah. fuck blah 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 now you're blaming your chief and you're blaming i said no i'm not blaming anyone i'm just telling you the influence that you all have mm-hmm. you know yeah and so yeah then two months later i was getting njp again for alcohol related incident and you know i was gonna ask you because in the navy one of the things that we do if we have a sailor that's struggling or like we notice that they're work ethics, smell the liquor on their breath, whatever. One of the things that uh, we automatically go to is call the devil and send them to medical, right? right. But you are medical mm-hmm. and nobody's noticing this. Uh, oh, 100%. Struggles. Yeah, 100%. Are they not offering you resources? Are they not? No, um, wow. no because, um, you know, a lot of people expect someone that wears that. Yeah. You know, the, maybe they just didn't know how to lead somebody with such a high award. All right. You know, I was the first Navy corpsman since 1972. And I just found out, honestly, from the Iraq war, I am the only living recipient of the Navy cross as a U.S. Navy sailor. There was only one other sailor that got awarded a Navy cross for the conflicts of Iraq and that. 17 year long span and that and he was a navy seal mm-hmm. right so yeah maybe they didn't know how to lead maybe you know i i never made it into the chief's ranks but i talked to a lot of my master chief and senior chief buddies of mine that outranked me because they never got in trouble and 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 right. kept moving right, up right. so i asked them a lot of, of those behind the door secrets why this why that and um some of them didn't want to be known as the leader that couldn't take care of the Navy cross guy. Right. That, yeah. you know, they didn't want to like a, a lot of my drinking got swept under the rug for years. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of, and what I, what's missing is just genuine leadership. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying you're not this way, but, why is it that the only time leadership cared about how much I was drinking was after I had explained myself to the CEO? Right. Where were you in between those times? Where were you, you know, on a, on just a, an everyday Saturday at one, two in the afternoon. Hey brother, Luis, this is your, C- your CMC or this is your chief or this is your HM1. Um, how's sobriety going? You've been getting your meetings. Do you need me to take you anywhere? Are you sitting at home alone? Do you, do you need some company? No, it was always hand me your, your meeting sheets while I was still under DAPA, right? Mm-hmm. So that they saw that I went to some meeting and that way in case anything happens and the SEAL's like, all right, Chiefs, did you do NDOC? We did NDOC on them, right? Pride and whatever. Um, pride and professionalism. Pride and professionalism. Yeah, yeah. We do that first thing, sir, right? He knows who our DAPA is. He knows this. He knows that. He just failed. And in my mind, I'm like, no, I didn't because none of y'all ever reached out and said, hey, just how is Luis Fonseca doing? 
how's your mental health? How is your drinking going? Hey, Luis, I realized this weekend when we're all together, you got a little more drunk than you normally have in the last yeah. four months right. that I've seen you. Is anything else starting to creep up? No, it's just, oh, yeah, we're all getting drunk. Then Monday comes along. Yeah, Fonseca was there getting drunk with us. You know, why didn't anyone stop it? Why didn't? So that's what I mean by genuine leadership. You know, that, like that literally just blows my mind that your your shipmates, your brothers and sisters, nobody was intervening at this time, and nobody was saying, "Hey, what's wrong? What's going on? Why are you drinking so much? What you know?" Like nobody is saying anything until you get caught, and mm-hmm. and then and it just reminds me of another podcast that we did previously where um suicide uh training gmts it's all just become a check in the box did you do this 100 did you do this yes check it off check it off check it off and we never get to the actual like hey luis are you okay man (laughs) we never we we never do that we don't and 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 that's what i talk a lot i did four chief transition speaks this year and i want to say in one form or another, the main question that I was always asked across those four was, Fonseca, where do you think the chief's mess failed you into not helping you become a chief? I said, where the chief smell failed me was when the chief's mess decided that the only way to be a chief is to check in boxes and mm-hmm. not be genuine. I said, because my teamwork ship blows everyone out the water. Right. My knowledge of my rating, I can go across almost any platform and operate. The awards I have, the vol- I got my MOVSM. I got, you know, I yeah. got all those wickets. I you started all the boxes, right? Yeah, Essentially. I, yeah, I did, right? I started, you know, sober life in the military uh, uh, program on base. Um, but those are things that I did that I saw out of passion. And, and for whatever reason, I've been retired now almost a year and I can, I can't tell you how many times even now I've gotten a phone call or text message at 11, 12 o'clock at night and sailors still calling me HM1 and I don't correct them because I know it's coming out of a, 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 a place of respect. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell them once like, Hey, feel free to call me Luis, but if you want to call me HM1 by all means um, like hey, HM1, we have um such and such here at the bar or we have such and such here at the barracks room totally wasted we've noticed these trends can you help us out and of course i'm like yes and we start putting plans in place things in motion i'll i've you know paid with my own credit card for ubers to pick up sailors some bars or you know because i live in ramona so i'm about an hour away um from bars in san diego get them home you know and then they come to my office on monday morning they're like mm. I'm like, hey, what's going on, shipmate? Like, hey, Chumon, do you need to talk to me? And, you know, they had that down, like, oh, man, yeah. I fucked up. And I'm like, talk to you about what? We just had quarters. I passed all the word I needed to pass. Well, you know about Saturday. What about Saturday? I mean, you had to come pick me up. Yeah, that's what I do as a leader. You did exactly what I asked you to, shipmate. Thank you. You did what I needed you to do was call me when you felt you were too drunk. Now, are you here because you want to feel like you need to talk about your drinking that is getting too out of hand? Uh, Maybe not right now, each one. I just want to see if I was in trouble. No, you're Mm -hmm. not in trouble because you did what I asked you to. And I came and I picked you up and I made sure my little brother or my little sister. And that's how I started talking towards the end. Because I never understood why you had to wait to become a chief to be a brother or a sister. Right. Wear the uniform, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I was like, my little brother, sister needed help. And so big bro was there. That's all that it came down to it. Unless there's something else that uh, you need to talk about. Like, hey, get out there, turn the wrenches and and um, and we'll deal with whatever else comes later, you know. Because how many times have sailors have been scared to call their chain of command? Because yeah. you hear you hear the, these two speeches always. How do the young kids say cringe? Um, when you hear a leader say, "Hey, if you're in trouble on two, three in the morning, give me a call. I'll come get you. I might be pissed off at you, but I'm going to come get you." 
Well, in my mind, why would I call someone that's already telling me right. they're going to be pissed off at me if I'm going <laughs> to yeah. call you? Exactly. That or that's a, the last person to call. <laughs> yes, yes. Or the B, the other uh, great one is I have, an, I have an open door policy. Please, anything you need, come to my door. But just to let you know, when you come to my door, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, did you go talk to this person or, or this did person you use first? Your chain of command? Did you use your chain of command? <laughs> so I tell them, and I told them this in the Chiefs uh, an, uh, season, this uh, four of them, I said, so you don't have an open door policy. Stop <laughs> lying to them. You have a chain of command that you expect your sailors to, to adhere to before they get to you because you're too much of a big boy or a big girl for them to come talk to you. You're too special. You've already separated yourself from the deck plates. Just with those two simple sentences right there, you know, and, um, and I've had chiefs that pull me in when they're like, give safety briefs and they, or they, you know, or I come in and I do my safety brief. I was the one like, call me at two, three in the morning. I will not be mad. I won't be upset. And matter of fact, I'll be whistling and humming while I'm driving at three in the morning and knowing I'm going to pick up my sailor and they are going to be okay. We'll stop at Taco Bell, McDonald's, Burger King. Don't care. I'll play whatever music you want on the way home and I'll get you there safe and happy. And I said, and then I say, and I told him, I said, I truly do have an open door policy. I don't care if you're an E1 or you're a O10. My door is open to any service member that just needs someone to listen to that can, they might be able to relate, you know? And uh, so, yeah, so those were probably the worst times. And then obviously on July 8th of 2018, when I decided uh, that the pain I was just living with inside was just a little too much to bear. And I put my Glock 45 to my head and I pulled the trigger and, um, you know, Glocks don't misfire. I don't buy cheap round, but um, that round didn't go off. Wow. You know? And on July 8th is really when I accepted. I accepted I am Luis Fonseca who suffers from alcoholism, addiction, PTSD, depression, other mental health issues. But those are just five things out of the hundreds of things that make up who I am. And it came a choice for me at that time because I was also drinking. I, like I said, I'd already relapsed. Uh, so I relapsed at that time. I was relapsed maybe two years into drinking again. And I knew, I knew um, the end of my story would be either if our great creator, because I'm actually practicing Buddhist now. Um, if our great creator allows me to live to be 80, 90, 100 years old, I want my kids, grandkids, and great grandkids to stand around and be like, you know, Pop Pop, he was an amazing man. He struggled when he was young, but he grew up to be a great dad and a grandfather, great grandfather, and we're going to miss him. Or your kids are going to be like, I heard my dad was good in the Navy. As a father, he was just a drunk and then he killed himself. I'm sorry, that's his life. Mm -hmm. And I knew yeah. I could not. It's not that I didn't want to leave my legacy like that because I really didn't care about my legacy. I didn't want to have to have my kids that be the end of their dad's chapter. You want them to be proud of you. Yeah. And they'd you know, be proud to talk about you when you're when you're gone. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. So I just knew on July 8th, after I had my suicide attempt, that for me it was hiding things, lying about things, covering things up, and drinking that away. Um, really became now to a life and death situation. And now I either choose to die or I'm going to choose to live. So wow. I tell you what, I've shot several Glocks in my day and they don't misfire. Mm -mm. And uh, I believe that that some a higher power was yeah. intervention. looking I mean, out for you. Did you ever right. consider, Luis, did you ever consider that your entire 22 years and where you are now and everything that you've gone through was all for a purpose of speaking to that young person and saving their life saying if he got mental health help I can get mental health help or speaking to that chief that says oh yeah I'm gonna, if you need me call me I'm gonna pick you up I'm gonna you know what just call me you know if did you ever consider that your whole life in in this nutshell is there for other people to learn from um 
as cliche as it sounds, 100%, right? But at the end of the day, it was still my choice to use my story in that way, mm. right? Correct. Because my story could have also ended and then Big Navy would have used my story like, how did we fail this war hero and he committed suicide on active duty? You know, how do we stop this? Well, you're, you're not stopping it first and foremost, Navy, because you're doing it the wrong way. In my personal humble opinion, right? Uh, right. Just it, I always tell people just an E6 that retired with red stripes. <laughs> what do I know? <laughs> right. But just in my humble opinion, you're doing it the wrong way. Um, so I genuinely feel that those trials and tribulations, um, surviving the suicide attempt um, has led me to this moment to be able to speak out, to ha maybe have a little bit more of a validity when it comes to mental health, you know, because there's so many great people out there that uh, have never dealt with mental health, health, but want to help, right? Yeah. Just like, just like I would tell, and I, I don't like to get political about anything, but, you know, things like, you know, when Martin Luther King was walking, you know, for civil rights, there was white men and women that marched right alongside with them. Yep. They didn't understand the struggle that Martin Luther King and, and his fellow brothers and sisters were going through, but they understood that it was wrong, right? But that means Martin Luther King was really the subject matter expert to speak on racism and, and his community and all that. Right. And so not trying to elevate myself to his status, nowhere near that man was an amazing man for our country. But I realized that yes, with this award, um, I could, use it to give validity to the fact that everyone hurts oh, yeah. everyone you know everyone's mental toughness can reach its limits um and that trauma is truly trauma you know um whether it's combat trauma i mean you see people that get in car accidents and never want to drive or get in a car ever again that's their ptsd that's their trauma right and um and to know that just because my symptoms are this doesn't mean that your symptoms that are maybe a little bit less than mine doesn't make them any less real or any less valid. No, it's just the way you're processing it. So I truly a hundred percent feel right now as a cliche as it sounds that this is, this is what I was put here to do on mm -hmm. this earth. Right. I was put here to, to face many adversities and challenges in order to help young men and women um, that might face their own. And, and, and I'm very, I'll say this with, I'm very proud of what I'm doing. Good. Very proud Good. of what I'm doing. And, and that's why, you know, my company, No Shame Foundation, uh, I'm not ashamed of who I am anymore. I'm not yeah. ashamed to carry the title of, of if you want to give me the title of war hero, I'll carry it. A uh, Navy Cross recipient of a uh, someone that's dealing with mental health, I'll carry all of that very proudly. I'm not ashamed of it anymore, you know, because at the end of the day, there's what, like almost 9 billion people in this world. I'm not going to make 9 billion people happy. I just need to make myself happy. And then that's going to make everyone around me happy. So yeah, I'm right. Yeah, I'm right. So the No Shame Foundation, you mentioned it real quick. So when did you start this? Um, so, uh, no shame foundation kind of started back in August of last year after I'd retired. Um, but I had been speaking out at HM balls, Navy birthday balls. And then especially after I tipped my suicide, I did a couple of, uh, suicide prevention talks for certain commands. And that's when I really started realizing when I started talking about my suicide, the HM balls was kind of a given, you know, you talk about war, we do this, you know, Corman, go to hell and back. Ooh, rah, yeah, blah, blah. Let's go to the fight, you know. Uh, yeah. But when I started really talking about mental health and my suicide and my drinking, um, I saw how personable I became to my sailors, how I became a human being just like yeah. them. You're no and, longer the Navy cross guy. Right. You're, you're like you know, real. Yeah. Right. You're no longer the Navy cross guy. You're no longer HM1. Right. And that's also another reason why I'm so very glad at the end of the day, I never put on anchors because even as real and as cool my junior sailors might have thought I am, once you put on those anchors, you really are separated from your junior personnel. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but anywho, so yeah, 
when I got out of the Navy and I, you know, I took the first two, three months to start growing out the beard. And um, mm -hmm. I live in California, so smoke a little weed, go down to the beach, you know, enjoy the California life. But then when I said, you know, what's next for me? And my wife and I really set it up so that financially we do not have to go back to work. Um, I decided to go to school and it was during school in HVAC school when I was talking to some young 18 year old kids that just graduated high school that don't have life figured out that are dealing with this mental stress and that mental stress. I was like, wow, I can relate to even civilians. And that's, uh, it was one of the guys in class that found out because he yeah, saw my license plate. He's like, Luis, what's the Legion of Valor? And what's that little cross thing? So I let, educated them on it. Like, wow. And, and uh, someone found my Wikipedia page and saw that I attempted suicide and I was an alcoholic. And, and uh, so he started talking to me about it. And that just sparked the idea like, hey, why not? Why not just share my story? If I suck at writing and I really don't want to write a book, why not just share my story over a podcast um, or a video? Just little snippets here and there of where my life is. Um, some of my videos I've talked about having to come back to the realization that I need to get a psych consult because my anxiety is kind of getting a little bit out of hand. And so, hey, I've been off of medications for 10 years, but it looks like I'm going to have to be put on medication. And I did. And I made a follow up video talking about um, the doctor put me on Zoloft and gave me a prescription of Xanax for my anxiety when it, the Zoloft doesn't help it, you know, and uh and so, yeah, I started that, like I said, in August of last year, been pushing forward. Um, something totally new to, to, to me is a running a business. So on certain things, I kind of put the cart in front of the horse, <laughs> um, learning things the hard way, finding out people trying to take the whole no shame from under me, because unfortunately I didn't, you know, trademark it before right, going right podcasting so there's we have lawyers involved right now but that's not for you guys to worry about um but it's just you know another it's just another typical Luis Fonseca learning it the hard way <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> instead of it. instead of after 22 years you know you get told find mentors find mentors find mentors and I have friends that run business and they're like Luis <laughs> send me your business plan and they're like it looks good tweak it here there and there and I tweak a little bit and I'm like oh but I got the rest. I know it all. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> well, you know, you got taken into shorts or you won't learn nothing. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Hard headed. But what is the No Shame Foundation? Uh, what is the purpose? What is it? What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you for asking that question. So No Shame Foundation, we are a nonprofit organization getting our 501c3 right now. Um, and even though we are going off of No Shame Foundation, it looks like it might have to end up being changed to No Shame Warrior Foundation, um, which is okay. Um, but the noshamefoundation.org website hasn't been published because of that. But our mission and vision uh, goal is just to educate people on mental health illnesses, the different uh, avenues that you can reach out to. And I want to reach out to a couple of um like the San Diego Legion, it's a the professional rugby team here in San Diego. They don't have like a youth thing, a youth camp for them. Um, so I want to reach out to them to see if maybe we can partner up and No Shame Foundation can sponsor, you know, uh, a youth rugby team for, you know, underprivileged uh, teenagers or kids, um, as well as you know, if, if, if our, um, if our good, uh, Lord or creator blesses, uh, us eventually have enough money as well. Um, because in the medical profession, as screwed up as this is, is you can call 911 because you truly feel it's an emergency. Right. And then they take you to the hospital and like, Oh, well, you weren't really suicidal. So it wasn't a real emergency. So that $5,000 ambulance ride, your insurance isn't going to cover it. So now you're telling me someone that was contemplating suicide is not in a good mental state. Now you're going to drop a bill on them that they probably can't afford right now, right? Where it's the least of their worries. Now you're adding more stress to them. Right. So that's where No Shame Foundation wants to come in and be like, hey, give me that $5,000 bill. Don't worry about it. Take care of your mental health. Hey, the insurance company won't pay for another two weeks 
of inpatient treatment, but you feel that you need it, uh, yes, No Shame Foundation, good to go, stay there. Hey, this clinic, No Shame Foundation is sponsoring that person's treatment for the next two weeks because they still wow. need it. So that that is what part of the end goal is. Another end goal would be to, um, since I live out in Ramona, which is about 40, 45 minutes outside of San Diego, I would love to be able to one day afford to, to buy 30, 40 acres of land, uh, build a, a retreat, um, with some small little houses, like one bedroom houses for veterans that are homeless. And for me to contract union workers to come out there and just give a week course on welding, electrical work, plumbing, HVAC work to maybe spark some of these guys' interest into getting into the trade field um, or maybe using the GI Bill to go back to school into a trade, get their hands back dirty again. Or if they just need to escape for the world for two weeks, because I've been at retreats, but then it's like, you get there and it's like, okay, at this time you're scheduled for this treatment. Then you're scheduled for this treatment. Yeah. Then you'll have 30 minutes of free time. Mm -hmm. Then you got this treatment. Then you got this treatment. It's like, man, I thought this was a retreat for me to just come and relax. Now and you're so busy that, the whole damn time. Yeah. You're busy. <laughs> yeah. So that, that is my goal. Like I'm not going to be a treatment center. I'm just going to be the getaway. I want to have horses. We're going to have a garden. So that way, whoever comes gets involved in an operating farm, mm -hmm. you know, you become part of this team, you know, and hopefully you walk away with some skill sets. And if it comes to one day, I can't afford to have, you know, employees and helping hands those people that walked to the door when they were hurting for me personally would be the ones that call and be like hey i have an opportunity i need uh to hire someone to maintain the stables we've gotten a little bit too big you were here last year you did great with the horses do you need do you need some job do you, do you want to move out to california do you know i have a small little one bedroom casita out there um and all you need to do is maintain these horses so we can provide services to our other brothers and sisters across the world, not just in the, in the uniform. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so that is what our, our, um, our goal is. And I know it'll take a lot of money. I know it'll take some time. I'm not rushing it. So right now it's just getting the story out there, showing mm -hmm. people that I'm a genuine person. You know, I'm not trying to write the coattails of any award to make any money because I've been approached on that too. You know, we're like, Hey, you know, we, we can write a book, we can do an episode, we can make this money, that money. And I'm like, okay, that sounds good. But it just, I never really felt it in the heart. And this, right. the, the, what we're doing, right. And then what I hopefully me and my wife are doing with the No Shame Foundation uh, uh, project, um, you know, it's all out of heart. It's all out of just compassion and wanting to help other people. Yeah, so it's been really busy um, because like I said, you know, Sometimes we think we know it all. And I found out that someone actually went and is trying to trademark um, no shame oh, wow. from un under us. So it's, you know, when you get lawyers involved and you have words like no shame foundation, you know, the intellectual property office of the United States kind of just depends who it goes through, whether they're going to approve it or not. Right. So. Right. Is just having to get some lawyers involved, you know, and um, as as anyone that might own a little business and sell products, then you get scared of, oh, man, can I even sell my products legally mm -hmm. right now? You right. know, you, and, and when you're sitting with a garage full of merchandise that can bring you, um, even though it's a nonprofit, it's still a profit for the business, right, to, to start right. help getting you off the ground. Um, but luckily the lawyer was able to calm our fears on that and, and let us know that, no, no, you guys are good. Y'all can still keep, uh, trading your, your, your coin, not trading or trading or selling your coins and t-shirt and hats. Um, he goes, you won't be an infringement, um, and any of those retrospects. So, so that's why it's been busy. The hospital court birthday month is this year. So, um, got to quite a few invitations to go speak. Unfortunately, I can't be everywhere at once. So. Right. I'm recording videos for some of them that just truly they just got the word two weeks ago that they, they were authorized to have a ball. And so, you know, they're like trying to look for speakers. I'm like, look, I get booked all the way from February. I said, but here's a thought. I'll do a really awesome video in, you know, my tux or my medals to address you guys if that's what y'all want to do. So I got two of those. I got to record this weekend for two different commands. And then after that, it's 
traveling to go speak uh, at HM balls, but I do always, I guess, shameless plug, you know, um, yeah. because I talk about mental health a lot in my speeches as, as well too, um, because I am a very big uh, advocate on the fact that if you don't take care of yourself first, you're going to be good to no one else. Sure. You know, right. I get, it, you know, sh- ship, ship, shipmate, mis- uh, what is it called? Ship, shipmate self. Yeah. But, you know, it, I forgot uh, the USS Franklin in World War II was the ship that took the most damage. 72% of that ship was damaged. And the CO still was able to, to ride, ride her home under her own power. So I tell sailors and leaders, especially if I rip 72% off of you right now, you're not going to make it home. So really, where should we be investing our money into a piece of equipment that I can forge and melt and put back together or into the number one commodity that, yes, we can say, oh, well, we make Navy sailors every day. True. But we don't make heat every day. We don't make Luis Fonseca's every day. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, um, and and I'm sorry, um, your your name again? Jamie. Jamie. Jamie, right? You know, we yeah. don't we don't make Jamies. You know, I can't go, you know, copy and paste another Jamie, right? So we mm-hmm. really need to start taking care of these men and women. The mission's going to take care of itself. The Navy's been around 200, what, 40 something years, I think. Yeah, 46. I'm pretty. Yeah, yeah, 246 years, right? It, it hasn't stopped now. It ain't going to yeah. stop because of me, you know. And, and especially those leaders that talk about, oh, well, if we lose this person, then we're, you know, our shop's gonna, going to uh, be at a deficit. And I sit there and think like, man, when I was growing up through the Navy, it was always taught to train your replacement, cross train so that there's never that issue, you know? Right. And, and so when I hear leaders saying, oh, no, try to change your medical appointment because you're too important and you need to be at this meeting. It's like, no, th- that person's not that important. You should have all that information. You should have all that information and, uh, and be able to run your shop. Right. Definitely. Definitely. So where, uh, Luis, where would our listeners be able to donate or buy merchandise to help the startup of no shame foundation oh thank you so much for asking that uh yes so uh facebook there is the luis fonseca comma no shame that is um where right now we are mainly operating under um on instagram i do have luis.fonseca.nc which does stand for navy cross um but that would just revert you back to our uh Facebook page. Like I said, unfortunately, we're planning on going live with the website last week, Mm -hmm. but then all the legal stuff started coming about. So we had to put a pause on that. Once the website is up, we'll publish it on our Facebook site, but that's just going to be noshamefoundation.org. And, uh, and that's where that will will come into play. So awesome, Awesome, man. Well, for over an hour, we've been spending over an hour with a fine American, American badass, Luis Fonseca. Thanks for so much thank for joining you. for us, man. I appreciate your time, brother. Thank no, you. no, thank, thank you guys so much. And I do apologize about the little technical difficulty at my oh, house um, with the with the internet, you know. And and as you can hear now, the the little one is is begging for my attention. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, so you'll have to edit him out. No, yeah. no, no, we're good, and uh, we can. Hey, the beauty of editing, man. Yeah, so or, or just like put him center song. stage. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> we want yeah. put him on the podcast. There you yeah, go. there you go. Say hello, everyone. Want to say hello? Hey. No. <laughs> shy, shy. No. But I will leave everybody with a thought. Uh, your rank at retirement is not does not measure your military service. No. At all, not even a little bit. It might help you with your retirement pay, but it does not measure your, your military service is measured by the, uh, the lives you've affected. And brother, you've affected a lot of lives in a positive way. Keep doing thank what you. you're doing, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep saving lives every day. And thank you for everything you've done for this yeah, country. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you guys for giving me this platform to spread the message, share my story a little bit. And hopefully, you know, one of your listeners out there that might be struggling gives them the courage and the strength to say, you know what, 
if he can pick up the phone and ask for some help, I certainly can do the same thing as well. Um, so thank you as well for allowing me this opportunity and, and, and in part coming along this mission with me to try to save more of our shipmates' lives and just human lives in general. So thank you guys as well. Hey, yeah. We're going to close out. Just hang out for a quick sec when we're done. And, okay. Uh, thank you, sir. With that, we wish you fair winds. And following seas. Hoo-yah.